welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. I wanted to start with a quote that I read, and I think you can uh, remember it. Uh, no one can take away the knowledge, skills, and experience you acquire throughout your life. Your knowledge, skills, and experience inform your decisions as you move forward. So go ahead, take the biggest step you can. That's your quote, Vanessa. Uh, that's absolutely true. I, you know, just finished probably my biggest challenge, which was K2, and that took three years. So a very humbling experience. Um, lots of steps there, so to speak. <laughs> And I was very uh, proud, uh, since we're in Norway, that uh, on, on my broader team was the first Norwegian to climb Broad Peak, wow. you know, on, on that team uh, last year. So, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's true because, you know, as we go through life, you know, we're, we're constantly, you know, observing, we're gathering information, we're acquiring different skills, and we don't know where that's going to take us. So we're kind of these mini little adventures uh, growing up, and it could take us to lots of different places. And that's kind of fun, you know, to play with theoretically and to say, okay, you know, let's just, you know, have a blank sheet of paper and, and see, uh, see where that takes you. And of course, you know, there'll be some pressure, there'll be some pressure to earn money, uh, you know, there'll be some pressure to leave home, uh, to be independent and all those things. So you'll, you'll carve out, um, you know, different career paths out of that but you know you got to have some fun along the way too so um that's probably where that quote originated from what was the reason that you wanted to climb k2 k2 is known for the world's most dangerous mountain what's what's the story behind it yeah it's interesting you know i i there's one quote from reinhold mesner that i always loved and that was that mountains are aren't fair or unfair they're just dangerous <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> I love that because, you know, people tend to, to take it personally, whether they summit or they don't summit, you know, it's, it's not like the mountain likes you or doesn't like you. Right. It, it's, sure. it's, it's not about that. Um, but K2, uh, actually, I, I didn't know much about K2. My, my only goal really was Everest. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, more or less looking for a, a big challenge and, you know, slightly learning earlier first about the stories of, you know, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And, you know, that was probably, you know, two of the most highly decorated, you know, soldiers of mountaineering, if you will. Um, and, you know, the ones who broke the first path in 53, climbing the highest mountain. But um, highest is not always hardest, you know, as, as we know. And I think once I, once I, finally did um, Summit Everest and the Seven Summits and the North and South Pole and a few other things. You know, I, I started along the 14 8,000ers, not with an intention to do them all, but, you know, I, I'd sort of pick one and say, okay, let's try this. Or, you know, I, I did Montesquieu sort of out of, out of the ordinary. But I was watching somebody uh, climb K2 in 2014. And I was watching his expedition, and I didn't know much about K2 at the time. And I, as I was watching his expedition, I was sort of learning about it as, as he was climbing, as, as that expedition continued. And I went through the whole history of it, and I was just amazed um, by what I discovered. It is when it was conquered, and it was conquered by the Italians, the Italians, um, Campanelli and Lacadelli, um, under... Ardito uh, Desio ran that expedition much like Sir John Hunt, like a military expedition. Uh, they took, they, they trained these men like soldiers and they didn't say that they were coming to, uh, you know, to climb K2. They came very clearly in all the press to conquer K2. They weren't leaving until it was done. And there's also some great footage about that. They ran it exactly like Sir John Hunt. It was a military expedition. They took, uh, you know, tens of tons of equipment. They took four miles of rope. They were not leaving until that mountain was accomplished. And, of course, you know, that's a whole different story in itself because, you know, certain men help them that don't get recognized. And I think it's pretty costly also to do an expedition. The time you have to have to... 
you have to take the time away from the uh, from work, but also pretty costly to do the exp- to the climb itself. Yeah, exactly. So you're not going to be able to afford it when you're when you're just starting out either. You know, there's no guarantee of success. So that so the more you you go for for a mountain, the more you deviate. So there's fourteen eight thousand meter peaks. The more you deviate from say Everest, which is more commercialized, the harder these things are, um, because there there are things that you really have to. Uh, you know, I won't say established roots. Most of them have roots, so to speak. It's more about, um, you know, how you're going to, you know, put in the fixed lines, the team you're going to bring, the on-the-ground logistics that you may or may not have. And, um, you know, trying to put together a climbing party in, in a foreign country, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, for me, Pakistan was going to be a challenge. I couldn't get anybody to tell me to go to Pakistan, <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest. I mean... <laughs> In 20, when I was doing my uh, research in 2014, everyone I asked was like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I tried everyone. I tried, um, you know, uh, Muslim friends. I tried international friends, friends who lived overseas. Uh, are you talking to other people that were like, you know, involved in the military or, um, you know, like Navy SEALs and people like that? And they were like, you know, absolutely no. Don't go to- <laughs> So basically, the advice that they offered me was uh, in two forms. One was, if you go, don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time, which is very specific. You know, what am I supposed to do with that? And the other, don't call attention to yourself. That second one was tricky. I had just appeared in like Forbes Online as like, you know, Vanessa O'Brien, first American British woman to try to conquer K2. What makes it so uh, dangerous? So I, I would say a couple of things. One is um, it, it's it's a very very steep mountain, unlike other mountains. Which you know, you know, people look at mountains from a distance; they tend to think they're all kind of rec- you know triangular shaped or something like that. But the reality is that when you're in there, it's it's not like that. There's plenty of turns and twists and you know ridges and places for you to kind of take a break where you're not vertical. But K2 really is a triangle. It's it's just like a child would draw a mountain. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really give you a break um, from the minute you're you're on the face. Um, so it's it's steep right off the bat. So you must be a good climber. It's endurance. You know, it's very steep. So you you know you have to be you have to be comfortable with that. And you don't know what the snow conditions are going to be. So, you know, it could be rock, it could be ice, it could be snow. Over three years, I've, I've seen all of it. Um, I would say that mountain was a different mountain all three years um, in terms of what it felt like, what it what it, what it was physically like in terms of... Uh, since it was uh, three years, did you uh, try it three times? So why was it three years? Yeah, yeah correct. So I, I started in uh, 2015. It was uh, an El Nino year, so as I would come to understand, I needed to become not just a climber, but um, to understand a little bit more about weather, because weather mattered. Um, and El Nino meant that the conditions on the mountain were, uh, it was far too warm, but ultimately that uh, what that turned into for climbing purposes was, it was kind of like a, like blue ice. But on top was like a, a sugary uh, snow cone consistency. So your crampons were constantly kind of slipping down this scree of snow and you couldn't really get to the blue ice. Um, and it was just it was just really crappy, you know, kind of climbing conditions. But I remember feeling very, very good because I pre-acclimatized in um, Ecuador. And I remember, you know, thinking, you know, I understand completely why people just want to keep going up and not going down. <laughs> Because, you know, when you're at camp too, it's like, and you're feeling good, you know, you don't always know that you're going to feel that good every time. And, and I really wanted to keep going higher, but, um, but no, that was aborted, um, you know, right smack in the middle of it because it just, it was just too warm. And, and um, we ended up having some rock fall, That's another thing with climate change is the rock that used to be adhered to the mountain now comes blasting down like missiles and they're big. So, you know, so one of the Sherpa uh, got a, a huge 
piece of uh, rock right uh, kind of in between his neck and his shoulder, um, dislocated the shoulder, broke the bicep, broke the wrist. And I want to say it's the first time ever that I had been at a base camp and saw intravenous morphine and ketamine uh, administered. Well, they tried to put his shoulder in place. Uh, but, but I do know the minute I came out of that, I, I wanted to go back. I had had a taste and I felt like it could be climbed. Um, but I, I came back the second year wanting to lead my own expedition because I also felt that it was the kind of mountain that would require more risk. And I couldn't ask a large commercial international expedition necessarily to take that risk. I, I felt like if I could be independent, that I would have a better chance of summiting. Now, there's, there's a lot of stuff in that statement. So I don't know how much of your audience are, are mountaineers or general listeners. There has been uh, four or five uh, before you that has, that has done the Mount Everest. So I think uh, okay. there are a lot of climbers listening. Yes. Okay. All right. You know, it, there's just, there's a, there's a lot in that statement. Um, so I was, I was right and I was wrong. <laughs> um, and I was right in that, yes, it will take more risk, um, you know, and it's, it's better to, to, you know, somewhat be independent and away from the commercial operators. However, I was wrong to think that I could uh, lead, um, you know, a team of Sherpa and high altitude porters and not, and, and be truly independent. Because of course, all the Sherpa know all the Sherpa from the other expeditions. So naturally they collaborate. And, um, you know, I think, uh, just to give an example, so that second year, um, we, by the time we uh, were at, camp, by the time we got to our summit bid and we were at Camp Two, when when uh, the the team went ahead to Camp Three, they arrived finding that absolutely everything was gone, all the equipment, the tents, the oxygen, the supplies, everything had been wiped from an avalanche. No, so you know. And there's there's an amazing piece of audio footage. It's a visual audio, actually, where one of the British uh, team member calls it down, and he says, "There's no such no such thing as Camp Three. And you know, of course, at the moment, everybody panics and says, "Okay, avalanche, you know, that's it." But the problem the problem here is is several fold one is. When, there's something called a recency effect, and it's a psychological term. And what that means is when somebody goes up and they first discover something, the assumption is it just happened. And because the brain can't kind of conceptualize, oh, my God, like what I'm seeing, they, they can't time and date stamp it, if you will. So they look at it, they see everything missing, and therefore they think it just happened. And And – they're so shocked, they're so, so horrified that they're not thinking through, wait, when did it happen? And they don't stop to look and analyze snow patterns or anything like that. But we did do that later with the pictures. So we're not sure it happened just then, if you will, because nobody saw it, nobody heard it. And, and we were one camp below. We were only a thousand meters below. Um, second thing is the big commercial operators had more stuff. Therefore, it was more, they, they lost more. They lost more oxygen. They lost more money invested in the oxygen and things that they lost. So there, when they said that they wanted to leave, it was an economic decision for them because it made, it, they didn't want to take a loss by continuing because you know too much was too much was gone right it's it's yeah purely an economic decision but for the smaller expeditions i lost some stuff yes and it would cost me some money but i also didn't have everything up there so i could have i could have scavenged around and found enough things to continue so my point in having my own expedition so that we could do exactly that continue 
But the problem is, is people lose momentum, they get, uh, you know, morale goes down, and they get very upset. Because now they see all the all the other Sherpa going from the other expeditions, you know, they're very superstitious anyway, you know, <laughs> is the mountain a god or, do, you know, do the gods live in the mountain? And once you lose momentum, there's there's no there's no amount of money you can throw at it, and there's no amount of um, coaching or, or teamwork or motivational speaking you can do to get people back up there. So I was wrong, right? I was going to end up going with the flow, <laughs> right? Even though I thought I was leading my own. Expedition. How was how was that for you, Vanessa? Because uh, I've been listening to you for half an hour, and you sound like a person that had a lot of drive. And when you have set your mind to something, you are going to do it. So how was oh, it? To, to go no, it was, it was no, it was it was it was terrible because you know there was the smaller expeditions got together. We tried to rally I, I, our liaison officers. You know tried to rally. By this time, I had become, uh, you know, a goodwill ambassador for Pakistan, um, a country I was initially afraid of. I had come to embrace and love and cherish. Um, Truly amazing. In a, you know, its own. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, who knew, right? Who knew that, you know, the, the most friendly, you know, wonderful people in the world were there because you'd never know that from the Western media. Anyway, so... Um, but now the question was, could I could I go back? Because you know, I'll tell you one thing: when you go when you go one time and fail, people are like, oh, you know, bit of bad luck. You know, <laughs> get, you should give it a go, give it another chance. You know, you know, uh, it was just you know, sod's law, whatever. And then, you know, everybody's behind you that second time. When you fail twice. <laughs> Just give up. <laughs> that cheerleading group are nowhere to be found. <laughs> are just like, you know, was it you? You know, was it the mountain? You know, they're just, they're they're gone. They're out of there. Um, but I also, you know, back to learning, you know, from your mistakes, I didn't want to do, I realized I couldn't do it exactly that way either. So what was the winning proposition? Um, and I had a really interesting conversation with one of the Sherpa because I actually Seven Summits has you know is a big operator, and uh, Di Gilbert and I, who is leading um, the, the British team, um, the Scottish uh, lass uh, from was leading the British team that second year. Anyway, she and I went over to one of the Sherpa operators and said, "Look, why don't you uh, subcontract <laughs> you know, some Sherpa with us and have them stay?" Um, you know, and he was he was very very clear. He's like, look, you know, the Sherpa the Sherpa will not listen to you because they don't see you as a as a full time employer on a consistent basis. And I was like, ah, okay, I got it. Because l let's think about this: if you're working for somebody and you know they're going to employ you every single year, mm -hmm. you're going to go that extra mile. Oh yeah, for sure. If, if you're if you're not going to see him again, you know why put your life on the line? Uh, from uh, this is correct, Vanessa. If uh, if they're doing uh, the Sherpas is doing one expedition that's a uh, year's pay or something, is that correct? Yeah. So they're what they're making is about five thousand dollars, and uh, you know plus a summit bonus. Um, and you know if you look at the GDP of of Nepal, it's you know somewhere like seven hundred dollars per annum, right? So you know, that's, you know, four or five times what, you know, the, what the average, what the average cost of living is, or not cost of living, but the average income is. So it's a lot, you know, they, they do make a lot, but they do take a lot of risk. Yeah, high so risk reward. High risk, high reward. Um, and, you know, and they always want, like every generation to have their children be better off than they are. So, um, so I, I was not sure that I would go back that next year. In fact, um, I had done some work at the Gilkey Memorial, and I knew that there should be 84 names. And uh, when I took inventory, I found 20 missing plaques. Okay. Um, and these plaques were old dishes that people used to eat off of in the old days, the military plates, tin plates. And when people died, they just took their piton and punched the name of the person and maybe the country and the date of death. And then they'd go, you know, hang them in the, at the Gilkey Memorial. 
And so when I found 20 missing, I was kind of gutted because I deserved to be represented. And so I, I went with Di Gilbert and a couple of liaison officers and we sat there and literally it was, it was like somebody had the list on their phone. Somebody else was like, you know, reading out the names and it was complicated because, you know, there's group plaques, some plaques are, are, you can't read, some are buried under other plaques and, you know, it's, it's a mess actually. And some are in foreign languages. So, you know, you, you got to transcribe some of them, but anyway, so finding 20 missing names, uh, Ralph Bay was one of the missing names, the Norwegian who had climbed um, with Cecilia Skog. And, but anyway, so I, I went and I, I was like, that's it. I'm going to make these plaques. And um, there were 37, let, let's see, it went back 37 years uh, over 13 different nationalities, those different 20 plaques. And I was like, I don't care. This is like a, I'm going to chalk it up to like, you know, historical conservation. And, but the point was, where do I find these? Right. So I had to go to Rawapindi, which was like the old military like city and find the tin plates. And then I wasn't going to key punch them because that's not a skill outside of my, um, you know, outside of my current skill base. I did engraved. Um, but my problem was who was going to take them back because I didn't know that I was coming back. Uh, so I sort of left them and, um, you know, kind of kind of forgot about K2 for six months. But I did meet um, one of the Sherpa who was climbing with a Chinese team in that second year. And he, he had a Chinese uh, uh, individual with him who was trying to climb all 14 8,000ers. And it was just uh, K2 left. He and I started talking and I was like, okay, I think this is the way to do it you know, let's partner to do this. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we can pull it off because, you know, I have relationships in Pakistan. You have the relationships with the Sherpa so they can see you as the leader of the Sherpa. I can lead the on the ground logistics in Pakistan. It to be self-sufficient because this was a big thing for me. I was looking very much at what the 1954 team did. So we also took four miles of rope. We also took, you know, plenty of oxygen, took everything that we thought we needed. We had something like, you know, nine tons of equipment. <laughs> that's, some log uh, that's some logistics job. job. <laughs> yeah. There, there were 12, 12, um, 12 climbers um, and they all came from, pretty hardcore backgrounds. I think, you know, on average, there were five, each of them had climbed five 8,000 meter peaks. So it was a really experienced team. Um, and, you know, that was it. Uh, so it, it was pretty, it was pretty intense. And I'll tell you, it was, it was K2, you, you know, what you asked about some of the difficulties, and I told you first just about shape, but, you know, the other problems about K2 is weather. Um, you know, you can look at Everest and say, okay, 78% of summits happen between, you know, let's say the 10th of May and, you know, uh, the 22nd or something, pick, pick date, you know, in the twenties, you know, when those summits are going to happen with K2, it's, it's really quite random. I can narrow it down about 58% is going to happen between, you know, uh, July 19th, let's say, and, you know, July 31st, something like that. But it's still, it's smaller, it's still more random. And, you know, by this time, I had had four years of actual weather forecast by day, Ooh. right? And here's what I knew. I knew I was never going to get four good days in a row. And that at some point, we were going to have to climb and shit. <laughs> And, and by shit, I mean, you know, deep snow, high winds, cold temperatures, and possible precipitation. How like cold is it? It's 40 below. Ooh. What, what do you do to mitigate risk? Uh, so because you sound like a very extremely intelligent person, but uh, you're doing a lot of risk di risky things. Well, so, you know, I, I had a med kit. Um, 
Dr. Dr. Peter Hackett um, at the Institute of High Altitude Medicine builds the, the med kits for me. So, you know, I had all the drugs um, for the team, you know, that we would have needed. Um, you know, that's the best way to mitigate risk. But, but I'll, the other thing is, you know, people have their own opinions about how much is physical versus psychological or, you know, mental uh, about climbing. Um, you know, you must arrive in the best condition that you possibly can be, but let's face it over six to eight weeks, your physical, you, you physically are going to deteriorate. So you have to have that mental willpower, that determination that can never go away. And, you know, what I started to see over these three years was uh, people spread fear. And this is really fascinating because I was watching it every year and I couldn't really put my finger on it until that third year. People would start to become afraid and they'd look for excuses to go home. And, and in a way, you, you can't blame them, right? It's understandable. Because nobody wants to die right? Uh, we're not going to war here, right? Well, we are, but we're not, right? This is, this is you know, it's, it's elective. But they, they'll see the avalanches come down and they'll say, oh, you know, uh, it's not looking good. I don't know that, that we're going to get a chance to go up. Or they'll look at the weather reports and the forecast and say, I don't know, you know, it's all 100 kilometer winds. We're, never, we're not going to be able to do it. And they'll start to psych themselves out. And then fear spreads. They'll go across these camps at base camp. And they'll find the like-minded and the weakest links. And the people who, who believe this, believe in this. And so I really wanted to contain the team this year. Because if I could contain them, I could keep them focused on the goal. I could distract them. I could show movies, play cards. I could do anything. <laughs> but... We don't have to spread fear, right? Mm, um, because I watched it, and, and they even make themselves sick. They'll become weak, and then they catch that cold, and suddenly, like, oh, no, you know, my, my kid's uh, birthday or my wife's anniversary, I have to get back. And it's like, wait, those things were always there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. As an observer, it must be extremely fascinating. Oh, oh, completely, because there's so much psychology going on. And, you know, you have to remember after three years, you know, I, I have a lot of information. But also, you know, people were worried, like, you know, that I, I was going to take unnecessary risks, that, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, not come back having done it, all this other stuff. It, it was not that. It was more that I knew and, and it always had a gut instinct that it was going to take more. People have very short-term memories. And I knew this even by the interviews when I came out, even by people, you know, like Explorers Web, you know, they forget what these summits are like. They forget that these summits take 16 hours and have by the last, like, you know, five teams. They forget that so-and-so lost toes. They forget that, you know... Uh, they forget all the gruesome stories because, you know, these summits only happen every three years, every five years. So these stories aren't new and fresh in people's minds. So when it happens to you, it's like, oh, wow, you know, it's, it, it took 16 hours to summit. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, and it was your third try. It's like, yeah, well, it took uh, Gerlinda Colton Browner seven times. Mm. You know, it took took a journey, Pasaban, you know, 16 hours, and she lost, you know, two toes. It's like, come on, guys, you know, it, it, it's hard. They don't remember. The point is, is this is not Everest, okay? There are no rules. And, and the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that you have to be prepared to climb in, in the worst conditions. and. I, I could see it, and I was joking with with the, with the Sherpa leader, saying, "Bet my I bet my actuals against your forecast." Like you know, in other words, what dates are going to work? You know, 
it, it's quite funny because I knew, I just knew we were going to have, we were going to climb and crap. But anyway, as it happens, and this is fascinating too. So, you know, we finally get up there in summit day, and we've got 1,000 meters left, right? Everyone, I, I, I called it like Dante's circle of, you know, circle of hell or whatever. <laughs> Every one of those hundred, you know, he had nine circles of hell. Every 100 meters for nine times was a circle of hell. And the funny thing is, is after 16 hours, starting at 11 p.m. at night, so that next day at 4 p.m., 4.30, whatever, we got to the summit. We climbed in the worst conditions, the worst conditions, everything that I just stated, right? Deep snow, high winds, low temperatures, precipitation. I kept watching the precipitation build, and I was worried about the avalanche risk. And I kept looking around at everybody to see if anybody was acting odd, you know, uh, cerebral edema, coughing, things like that. But the point was, these guys were from China, right? They have really shitty winters. Iceland, you're right, say no more. I was in the North and South Pole. I mean, you know, we had all, bar an act of nature or, you know, Mother Nature, an act of God, we weren't turning around. And we got there because we were also having to put in the fixed lines at the time. When we got to the summit, you would never believe it. It was a bluebird day. Wow. Not a single, not a single cloud in the sky. Wow. That must have been extremely feeling. But but who knew? And that's why I'm saying like those, you know, what's above does, you know, knows what's below, but what's below never knows what's <laughs> above. And and it's so interesting because in those nine circles of hell <laughs> of those hundred meters. It was so bad that one would almost think, why continue? You'll never see anything, you know? And apparently people who watch the tracker, like the tracker, John uh, Iceland and I had it on, it wasn't moving. So it was really painful to watch. And people thought it many times, like it just stopped and maybe we, we died, you know, but but we did it. And it was so, you know, it was very painful, you know, ended up, you know, kind of 23 hours round trip, just camp four to summit. Um, but the conditions proved why it took so long. It wasn't because, you know, anybody was, ba was feeling bad or there was any problems going on. It was just the weather was so extreme. And I didn't care about any of it except precipitation. Because, yeah, it's just gone. That was my main concern because, you know, it, it, it's game over. I also had happened to hear Ed Vister's tell a story um, maybe a couple weeks before I climbed about his K2 attempt, and he was with Scott Fisher. And Scott Fisher was the kind of guy who lived in the um, present, and Ed lived in the future. And they were climbing together, <clears throat> and Ed said he would never have summited K2 because when that snow started falling, he would have turned around because of the avalanche risk. Whereas Scott was like, oh, we can, we can run up there and run down. <laughs> and, you know, of course, who's not here today, right, Scott? So, you know, it's fascinating, but it is all about risk appetite, all about risk appetite. Um, you know, and it, it, it's, not, it's not for anyone. I, I don't judge those, you know, lots, lots of people turned around. I, I said goodbye to them at camp too, in the most horrific winds. But you know something? There's a huge wind tunnel right at camp too. If you just move a little higher, it's gone. This is the problem with the mountain. Is it's, you, can't, you can't look at any one spot. Every 100 meters, it's a totally different place. And, and that's why it's, it's so fascinating to me. Everest is much more consistent. You know what you're going to get for the next 3,000 meters. But this is so bizarre. It's like you don't know what you're going to walk in or up or down into, which is almost a case to kind of continue because, you know, like I showed you, it got better at the top, not worse. 
What made you so mentally strong? Oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I need a pendulum and I have to go, you know, lie down for that one. Uh, <laughs> what makes you strong? Um, yeah, it sounds like you're pretty mentally tough. Yeah, you know, well, it is. It is. It, that's why I say it is much more mental. Oh, you know, look, I have all the language up there, you know, pretty bad language. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I you know, swear like a sailor and everything else. You know, I mean, at the time, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, pretty miserable and, and, you know, yelling my head off and everything else, but I'm not turning around. Why is that? Uh, Why is that uh, to never give up? Well, you know, look, it's, it's, um, you know, I'm, I, I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm weighing off the risks, you know, versus the rewards, you know, I have a gut feeling, you know, that, that, that we can do it. But, but all, but, you know, these, these aren't things you can do alone. Um, you know, I'm not a soloist. Um, I, I don't, um, you know, it's kind of like the principle of scuba diving. I, 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 you know, I really believe strongly in having that uh, climbing buddy with you. Um, if nothing else at high altitude, you're not the best person always to be in judge of behavior. Although, Of course, you think you are, um, but I don't know. We're, we're you know willpower. I guess you know coming up through life and and having those experiences. I mean, you know, I look at you know the it's people who you admire and things that you've come across and things that you've encountered. You know, I my heroes are people like Shackleton. You know, who who you know set out to do enormously great things and you know when things didn't go his way you know he went back and he saved his 22 men you know um you know I, i find stories like that so inspirational and you know and some of the military guys you know if, if you spend any time with military you know they have to go through a lot uh you know mental you know training more than Physical, physicals. I, I just assume physicals there. You got to do the work. But I'm just saying, like mentally, you know, the, the hardest part is there's always going to be like that little part of you that comes out that says, you know, I'm cold, I'm uncomfortable, I want to turn around, I don't need to be here, and you just got to quiet that voice. How do you do that? So I do it by counting. Um, you know, uh, I remember watching. Um, one of the snipers uh, talking about um, being in Afghanistan and he was leaning out of a helicopter and he couldn't, he couldn't really tell the difference because it was all rock. It's all like the same color and there's no differentiation and he can't see anything. And he, you know, concentration was his most important thing. So for me, concentration is my most important thing by counting. And he was counting, he would go zero to a thousand and a thousand to zero I might sing 99 bottles of beer on the wall. It takes a really long time to get down to zero. But anytime you count, you, uh, you're taking those negative thoughts and kind of putting them on a boat and, sh you know, sending them down a river, you know, in your head. Because they'll, they'll, they'll come in. We all have like, you know, the angel and the devil on the shoulder thing. But you got to send those negative thoughts off on a boat and just keep the concentration in the present. Don't let your mind wander. I, I never ever think about like, you know, uh, you know, bad things or well, you know, I'm thinking about the avalanche stuff. It's not like I'm not worried, but I'm not. Um, it's under control. And, or, and also, let me say something about that because control is interesting. People say talk about fear. Fear to me is is interesting. I I don't have fear because I'm in control. Oh, interesting. Please elaborate. <laughs> yeah, because fear, so I don't have fear because I'm in control. And and let me tell you, you know, another analogy that I like. You know, people are always like, oh, avalanches, avalanches. An avalanche is to a mountain what water is to a dog. So when a dog gets wet, it shakes. When a mountain gets too much snow on it, it shakes. That's an avalanche. Okay. 
you know, I talk to a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. Let's, Understand. Let's, <laughs> but let's keep it simple. Let's not make it more complicated. When that, when you see a lot of snow starting to fall, you have to keep your distance because we know that the mountain will avalanche. The problem, of course, is if it starts to avalanche in the middle of your ascent, right? Or it starts to snow, rather, in the middle of your ascent, then there's the possibility of avalanches. Then you have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan C. Plan yeah, yeah, right. But in terms of fear, I am never afraid because I'm in control. But I do have instant fear when something goes wrong. But I don't know that until it happens. So to me, fear can't be planned. <laughs> that's, 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 that's extremely interesting because often when we experience fear is because we're focused on, focus on something that can maybe happen. So yeah, in but that's some not, way, in some yeah, way you can control it. Yeah, and, I, and people should never do that. Why are you doing that? Um, this is fear, for sure. real fear. <laughs> Real fear happens instantly, mm. is uncontrollable, and it happens the moment you think you're going to die. Mm. Like if you fall, if you slip, if your oxygen runs out, those are the times, and you can't plan them, that your body's going to go, whoa, shit, that like fight or flight, all of those chemicals, that, at, that lactic acid, everything's going to start throwing through your veins, and your brain is going to say, oh shit, it's time to die. Mm. It's a physical response and it's really horrible. It's only happened to me twice. Okay. But that's why I'm saying fear cannot, cannot be planned. Can you elaborate on one of that episodes? Well, one was uh, just, uh, it was actually climbing up the, um, the Lhotse face, uh, going to Camp 3 on Everest. And I, it's, we were having a front point because it was, um, you know, it's a steep bit of ice. And I had oxygen. I looked down, and the oxygen got cut off. Um, and because I wasn't expecting that oxygen to get mm. cut off, I had it signaled to my brain I had no oxygen. Well, the cord was t twisted, but, <laughs> but you know, my yeah. brain's not figuring that out at the time, right? Mm. And the other was just repelling off. Um, uh, where we're, must, must, I think Choyoyu. Um, and I, I was way, way, way far away from the ledge I needed to land on. And um, I really thought I was just going to run out of rope and say goodbye. I just couldn't swing my body over to that ledge. So how did uh, you control yourself or manage to survive? Well, you know, uh, in both of those, I got out of them. But it was just at that time, that extreme fear of thinking, this is it. Mm. That's why I, I don't understand when people talk about fear. Either they've never really experienced it to know the difference. You have to really, your brain has to really go into a mode where it says, you're dead. Um, because when it does that, you'll never question what real fear is. Oh, this is, you, sorry for interrupting, Vanessa. Yeah. The, the reason I'm talking to you now is because I experienced panic attacks some years ago. And, uh, and uh, as you know, uh, panic attacks are fear that is not uh, real. Yes. And uh, when I experienced it, I was uh, driving in in Spain on the way to Gibraltar to watch uh, to watch the monkeys. And uh, as I was driving along, I suddenly had a panic attack. I was sure I had a heart attack, and uh, it felt so real having that fear. <laughs> and right. And the so you remember that feeling now, even though it's a panic attack, yeah, for right? Sure. Yeah. Because your brain is telling you it's real. Yeah. That's real for you. Yep. Because you're going through those physical symptoms. Mm. Because as far as your brain is concerned, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. It's really happening. You are having that heart attack. You are going to die. Your body's going through that same that same symptom. Yep. So I would say, you know, that. That's real because your brain is thinking it's real, whether or not whatever brings it on is or isn't. Yeah. Um, because it's it's how the brain is interpreting it. Um, but when people walk around like climbing and looking around and worried about stuff, yeah. and that's fake fear. I don't yeah. know what that is. Yeah. It's worry. It's not fear. Oh, it's worry. But, much fear, sure. Yeah. But don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> because you know that's why you know count. 
or if or you know the did, point did, is did you learn that from banking because when you're uh, as uh, as a former banker i presume that uh, in some way no i i actually i i never actually i did i did it without thinking but later i saw it uh, on that military program um that that's what the snipers were doing and i thought well it's ah. It's uh it's a good thing to do because just you know, look, we climb at night when things are still and frozen. Um, there's no differentiating object. I can't use my eyes to say, all right, let me get to this um, you know, ice patch to that ice patch or this rock to that rock, or you know, I, I have no visual references. Hmm. So when you take your eyesight away, you have to use, you know, something else. To keep going, and you know, if, if if nobody's ever done anything for 16 hours, right? Imagine, and and here's the other thing: it takes some effort to go up, right? Of course, but it takes very little effort to go down and to fall to your death. Um, you know, 85% of these accidents happen on descent, and it's when people are knackered, they're dehydrated, you know, they're exhausted, you know, they've given all their energy. And it's, you've got now gravity pushing you, pushing you down the mountain. So it's so easy to slip. It's so easy to miss throwing a carabiner in safety. It's so, it's so easy to get a repel device incorrect. You're lowering your guard, I presume. Oh, it's, it's terrible. And I've, I've just read some awful stories about, you know, really, really famous, famous, you know, Polish climbers who just, you know, fell, fell, mm. slipping on the ice. It's like, God, really? You know, that just sucks. But it's such a real possibility. So how was it to do the North Pole? So the North Pole is uh, is worrisome because, you know, it's melting. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, you know, what people don't understand is when you, you know, when you traverse across something like Antarctica, you're on land. But when you try to traverse from you know, or to the North Pole, uh, you're on the Arctic Ocean, you know, so you're on water or hopefully ice or soon you'll be swimming. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's thin and it's uh, receding and this is what everybody's worried about these days and they have a right to be because, you know, pretty soon it's an ice-free summer, like in another 15 years or something. Um, That's scary. And it's so scary because, you know, when we lose the ice, we lose, you know, the polar bears, we lose the, the fish, the krill, you know, the, all the things that use the ice, you know, for living and breeding and mating and everything else. Did you experience the polar bears in the uh, North Pole? Well, so we, we carry uh, flares and we carry a rifle um, just in case, but I, I don't think they go that high anymore. You know, there's no food source. Um, so with deep regret, I have never seen one. Um, I'll have to go back to Svalbard and, you know, <laughs> hang around. I'll find the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, probably, you know, take some bait with me or something. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, they're gorgeous animals and, you know, they should be protected. Um, but it's, you know, it's a fascinating trip because the other thing is you're trying to hit a moving target. So you're on ice that's moving. So, you could, you know, ski all day and turn around, go to sleep, and find that you're, the current's taking you in a different direction, <laughs> and you've negated your whole previous days, like um, you know, ski, and and that's that's a head trip for sure. Yeah, I, talk, I talked with about uh, with uh, uh, Berge Auslan. Oh, he's awesome, awesome yeah, about that one. So uh, it's he's all the no, same it's... thing, the moving ice, mm. and he's the master, right? Um, you know, he's really, there's some, just some great uh, material. I love the way he and Randolph Fiennes went, you know, neck to neck over the years, mm. uh, trying to be king of the ice. And there's Borgie wins hands down on that one. Um, but yeah, it's awesome. He's he's an he's a amazing polar explorer. So how long time did it, did it take you to the North Pole? So the North Pole... Uh, I want to say like four or five days, but this was just the last degree. So, you know, that's 111 kilometers. Um, you know, things are changing, but in, you know, then in 2013, we used to go um, kind of a traditional way. 
Svalbard, we'd fly up to uh, um, Barneo, which was a Russian um, base camp that was set up temporarily, you know, for like 20 some days in April. Mm. And, uh, you know, the Russians were always in charge of that. Uh, Russian Geographic Society was there. They're, they're the ones that would award you your North Pole certificates. Okay. And then they'd fly you to that last degree um, uh, by helicopter and then, um, you know, pick you up. Um, but you were, th- you were really there with, with your guide and that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's fascinating cause you, you know, all those things are used to be tracked. And if you went on Barneo's website, you could see everybody's patterns and, and how they moved or, or didn't move and what was a straight line or whether they went off course. And it was fascinating to watch over the years. <laughs> um, but it, but it's a good fun, you know, there, there, it's, it's a totally different world up in the North pole. Um, but it's, it's great. I mean, it's just that it's changing so much. I, I don't know, you know, if those trips are going to be possible for very much longer, certainly not, certainly not from the coast. I don't even know, uh, if, if, uh, you can go from Canada anymore. Um, I don't, I don't think they have the safe, they don't have the safe, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Like this, um, search and rescue anymore. Okay. Uh, Ken Bohr Airlines or something. So, but it's, 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 um, you know, it's great. Adventure is fantastic. Um, I, I'm now doing different things too. I'm, I'm going to have my first race car drive at 200 miles an hour with uh, Mario Andretti. Okay. That's oh, up. please elaborate. <laughs> uh, which is very exciting. Um, so, uh, this was kind of an offshoot of a, of a, of a journalist friend, um, Jim Clash on my third year. He, he said he had something to give me when I went to K2 and he, he took off something that looked like a Super Bowl ring or something that Putin would really want. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and, and I was like, Oh my God, no, you know, thinking, I know he had to earn that. Right. He had to drive that car. And he was like, I want you to bring this back. And I know he, that gesture, you know, it was so touching because I know he was, you know, he was using it as leverage, but he was also worried. Um, anyway, I wore it around my neck, and of course, it did make it to the summit of K two. And so I, you know, I was joking and said, you know, when I gave it back, that I'll have to get my ring one day. And so, before too long, you know, there I was signed up with Mario for that drive to earn my own ring. Wow! Uh, which is happening uh, at the end of April. Wow! Um, I was. Really, oh, please really share some pictures. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I, mean, I can't wait. Um, the other adventure I had had with uh, Jim beforehand was testing bulletproof vests. Okay. So um, he and I, it turns out you can't get shot anywhere. Um, that may surprise you, but uh, things could go wrong. So we, ha- we had to go down to Colombia and uh, get shot in Bogota. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see this one coming. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, point blank range. Um, you know, it was like a thirty-eight, and uh, no. you put the vest on, and you know they shoot you. Why? Right, uh, Why? <laughs> Why God's name do you do that you know, for fun? <laughs> and it's interesting because you know he does it in front of his staff to prove that the product works. Um, okay. But of course, you know, if if they do something wrong and they don't sew it right and they don't put the Kevlar in, and uh, right. you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you'll be in the hospital. Um, you get a hematoma, you know, a, a bit of uh, a skin and bruising, but it saves your life. Um, and oh, it's please amazing. Please say you were scared, so scared, when you're standing in front of the inventing for people to shoot you. Well, you know, it's, it's, so here's what's interesting is when he practices, and this is another psychological trick, it's funny, because he says, okay, one, two, three, bang, one, two, three, bang. But when he really does it and you pick your bullet, you get to pick your bullet. <laughs> oh, put thank it in the gun. you. <laughs> but when he really shoots and your hands are behind your back, he shoots, on, he shoots on one. Yeah. So that you don't have time to take your hands from behind your back. Mm. Because if you move, it's all over. Yeah. So it's very, very clever. So all the practice times, he's shooting on three. But for real, he shoots on one. So... Um, so yeah, that's kind of fun. But <laughs> what made you do that one? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so it was, it was actually. Um, I was a photographer for um, for an article 
okay. uh, that the journalist was doing, but I was like, Hey, you know, it's no fun unless I can, I can get shot. <laughs> um, and he was very nervous because he had only shot like four women and he didn't believe in shooting women because <laughs> they're very machismo down in the South. And, you know, it was like, you know, he was very nervous. You could see him loosen his tie and he was sweating his forehead. <laughs> it's, it's all the right motions. So Understandable. <laughs> Not that I was nervous. It was like his body, his body just made me nervous. <laughs> but no, that was, that was all fine. Um, so, you know, look, just, just some good stuff. Um, I've got some other kind of fun things coming up in terms of, um, in London on May 22nd, um, there's the Explorer Awards. Okay. Uh, I've been awarded Explorer of the Year for the Scientific Exploration Society. Congratulations. Um, thank you. That's an Imperial College, and I'm really excited about that. Um, this is a great organization. You know, there's a couple that really, really, um, you know, believe a lot in, you know, not only science, but conservation and, you know, really you know, putting together adventure and science. And, you know, I think when you first start out, as we all do, it's all about, hey, you know, this is just going to climb a mountain or going to do this or that. But when you get there, and over time, um, you can see those opportunities as a chance to kind of give back to science. So I really don't try to do an exp expedition today without doing some scientific research. Um, so K2 for me, I, I uh, took some glacier samples and um, we uh, were looking for radiogenic isotopes. I don't want to get too scientific for you here, but uh, what that does is it looks for lead content in okay. the uh, ice and we can run that through a machine called a mass spectrometer. And um, really the, what we're doing is the two things. We're look, we, we can age the ice by depending depends on the lead that we find. So we can't go earlier than the 50s when the Soviet tests were done because that's lead content from then. I can see Chernobyl, which had a different lead content, or I can see Fukushima and things like that. They all had different um, types of lead. And sure enough, I found um, the lead content in Fukushima um, in the Caribbean. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. So it really shows that was in Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, it really shows that uh, one, you know, one disaster that happens somewhere in the world happens everywhere. And this happens because they go up in the westerlies, they have travel to the atmosphere, and they settle, um, you know, in, in other regions. That's scary to think about. Oh, no <laughs> <That's chance. worrisome. laughs> because you know that that water is going to melt. It's going to feed, you know, all the irrigation and head rivers and everything else. So. But, you know, I, I think over time, you know, science becomes more interesting because, you know, we're there and uh, these scientists can't get there. So why not um, help them, you know, advance their research? Where can, um, where can people follow you in the social media? Who's that? What's that? Uh, where can people follow you in the social media? Where can we find uh, you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they can. Um, there's uh, It's VOB, Victor Oscar Bravo online. Um, so there's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, well, less Facebook, actually there is Facebook, but I don't use that as often. Okay. Um, and so if I want to see that you're driving Mario Andretti, where can I see that one? In oh the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have that. I'll post that everywhere. I'll, it'll be on all, uh, it'll be on the website it'll, and that's a uh, www.vob online or no VOB. Uh, what is it? Um, good question. Um, uh, I think it's vobonline.com, VOB maybe. Yeah, yeah, correct. And your, ins uh, and your Instagram is the same. Yeah, I'll post all that stuff. That'll be fun. And then on June, so that's in London in May. And then in June, I'll be at the Women in the Outdoors Week okay. on June 13th, which is sponsored by Discover Outdoors as part of Arcteryx um, Women, talking about uh, K2 and all this fun stuff. So yeah, I'm looking forward right. to that. In Soho, um, but otherwise I'm writing. So I've just um, finished a book, and um, okay. that's been the hardest thing actually. Climbing mountains is quite. <laughs> Everybody says that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Getting into your own head and trying to like articulate, like you know, who, what, when, where, why, all that what stuff. Is, what is so hard about it? Because you're not the first person saying that uh, they have done some <laughs> amazing hard stuff, and uh, the book is always the worst. <laughs> What's so hard no, about I'm it? Why the book is, is hard because you know, huh, you know it's it's hard because 
it's it's describing what you're doing versus doing it. And I think in the langu- in the language of uh, you know mountaineering and even business, you know, less is more. Nobody wants to hear people ramble on and it's like, you know, a 30 second elevator speech. So tell them what you got to tell them and get it over with. Mm. But in literature, it's not about a blue sky. It's like, what color blue? Uh, Were there clouds? Were the clouds moving? You know, everything's so descriptive. And, you know, I've perfected removing all that descriptive language. Mm. So now I'm having to put it back in and it's difficult. (laughs) That's understandable. When, when, when is the book coming out? So I'm just, I've just got a literary agent now, and uh, we're just going through that process. I think that, um, you know, we'll see. I, I think it's kind of a long process. So, you know, a literary agent takes the book. You know, there's a book proposal. It gets shopped around to publishers. The publisher, you know, gets the book, and they do what they want to do with it. And, you know, yeah. God knows how long it takes to do after that. But, but what it looks like is... Can you give me a heads up when the book is coming out? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it won't be till you know probably next year at this rate. <laughs> well, then, the, the people are waiting for something good. Always wait yeah, exactly. for a good long time. Exactly. Uh, but do send me um, when you when you cut this up, send it to me, and uh, I'd be get, glad to um, you know add it to. I've got some audio stuff on my YouTube channel. Yeah, I'm for sure going to do that. And can you please send me some pictures that I can use? Oh, sure. Sure. Thank you so much for taking the time, Vanessa. I'm, uh, okay. I'm, I'm Pleasure. It's really, truly in- inspiring. And, uh, and uh, you gave me some new uh, techniques as well. So now I'm going to start counting. No, really a pleasure. And, um, you know, you've had some great hosts. So it's, it's a pleasure to be amongst, um, you know, the many uh, people that, that you've had on your show and podcast and you know, great job. Keep doing it. And um, pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. You too. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.